Now, the biblical worldview is either a decent worldview or it's not. And you can't step outside of, a, of, of the Christian worldview in order to argue back to it. That would mean there'd be something wrong with the Christian worldview that you have to step outside of it for, yes? And then we talked about neutrality, did we not? Do we talk about neutrality? The fact that there isn't any? Okay. As far as unbelievers are concerned, they are not neutral, but they do think they are neutral. Please get this into your heads, okay? They think they are neutral. They think they are unbiased, particularly atheists. Atheists in particular are convinced that they don't have to prove their view. And we'll come back to that um, in a later lesson. But they're convinced that you have the burden of proof. Okay? You must point out to them that they are not neutral and you shouldn't be neutral. Why shouldn't you be neutral? Because you're a Christian. You're on Christ's side, aren't you? You know, you're on the Bible's side. So, of course, you're not neutral either. But there's nobody's neutral, folks, okay? <laughs> Nobody is neutral. There is no uh, kind of neutral zone where people can meet together to say, oh, yeah, let's arbitrate, let's decide, okay, if your arguments are right or wrong. You cannot do that, folks. It's just impossible. Um, and we'll look more into that tonight. Everybody comes with a bias. Everybody comes with a worldview. So at the end of the day, it becomes a, an argument or a, a conflict of worldviews. Okay? Not a conflict of individual details and data and evidences that are within some kind of neutral worldview. But you, what we're asking really is which worldview accounts for the data that we have and the arguments that we're using. Do you see? And we've called this way of argumentation a, I'm sorry about the word, transcendental argumentation. And we call it transcendental uh, for two reasons. First of all, they're connected. First of all, because it, it comes from God, okay? We're arguing from outside of the closed system of the universe in which we're part, okay? And we are drawing down, do you see, God's revelation, and we're, we're standing on that. Because after all, God is the one who has defined what he's made. So if we're in agreement with what God has said he's made the world for and how he's made it and so on, then obviously we're going to be standing on firm ground. If we're not in agreement, then we're going to be in error to the degree that we stray from the designer's intention. That's a straightforward um, argument, isn't it? Do you understand that? Now, what's the world's worldview? What does that look like? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about ancient uh, world views or we're talking about modern uh, atheistic, naturalistic worldviews or New Age worldviews or Eastern Monist worldviews. What do they all have in common? What do they look like, though? Here's what the biblical worldview looks like, the creator-creature distinction. One sphere. One sphere, very good. Okay, one sphere. And so God, you see, becomes part of that world or that system of reality. Now notice that this is, we can call this a closed system. Okay, this is how um, unbelievers view the world. So, when a, for example, an atheist, because you're going to, when you go to college, you bunch 
when you go to college or you know when you talk to atheists because that's the cool thing to be nowadays for people that don't believe you know they're not not just they haven't thought very much about it but they've probably um, listened to Neil deGrasse Tyson you know who's an atheist and people like that and got a few things that they've cobbled together and they think they're smart so they view the world as a closed system which means that they're viewing your idea of God within the, their closed system do you see you're going to have to reject their idea of reality and say no I don't agree with your system of reality that's ridiculous I don't believe with a God in a God that's inside of reality I believe in a God that transcends reality that is before reality and that reality that is the universe is upheld by and depends upon moment by moment so this is a creator creature distinction it's always denied by unbelieving uh, world views any questions on this part of things this is really important because when you get to college everybody's going to be looking at the world like this they just take it for granted they're going to take it for granted that God is within that one sphere of reality and that's how they're going to argue that's a, and so if you meet them on that ground okay they've got you because you've already sold out your worldview their worldview this idea of, of reality being a single closed system okay cannot account for itself which is what we're going to do today it cannot account for itself and we started off remember we started talking about no God you know if you imagine the world where God doesn't exist or you imagine the world where God is just a limited God and there has to be another God who competes with him or her um, those systems don't work they can't explain themselves if you take the third approach which is the Eastern approach which is well the world doesn't exist okay because individual things don't exist There's, everything's one and we're in a dream all right you're looking at me like uh, do people really believe that yeah they do okay these monks you see walking around here they they profess to believe that stuff um, and then they have a basket which they want you to put money into okay whereas if they really really believed that everything was one they wouldn't believe in the basket and they wouldn't believe in money and they wouldn't believe in going to you for money because you don't exist do you see how their their worldview doesn't make sense all right and in fact you could push that further and you could say every time they do that they are going further and further away from their goal because their goal is to merge into the one and if they keep going out begging for money every time they do that they are as it were turning their backs on what they think reality is well isn't it that they believe that nothing exists or that we're living in an illusion they believe that nothing as we see it here exists so it, because it is an illusion it's a dream yes no because every time they do that they're stuck more in the, the illusion do you see and one might ask this does does um, mickey mouse know he's a cartoon character <laughs> does he okay so how do we how do these people know that they're in a dream of someone else you see it's it's kind of it's it's doesn't really make sense so you've got the, the, the all of them have this kind of closed system view but it, it doesn't make sense okay and we'll see this even more we've got more work to do on this so you're good with this yes all right
as a Christian, you must stand your ground. You must stand your ground. You must not um, allow people to come in and say that you're the one with the burden of proof. Okay, and we're moving into that era, area where you're going to see this more and more on how to do it and why you do it, why it's uh, God-honoring to do it that way. All right, what I want you to do is go to Proverbs 26. Four and five. Okay. You all there? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So in some of these uh, atheist manuals that attack the Bible, you know, say it's got all contradictions in it and so on. Uh, this is one that they throw up, okay? This is a clear contradiction, they say. Which, as with most, nearly, well, like 98% of these so-called contradictions that they bring up, they're just not reading very carefully, okay? You have to pay attention to the Bible. Uh, the people that wrote the Bible were not stupid, People that copied the Bible were not stupid. And uh, if you see something like this, then it means pay attention to what's being said and think through it, because these are not saying the same thing. All right? But this text helps us in our apologetic approach. This is basically, um, as far as the method that we are adopting, this is the text that we need to keep going back to, to remind ourselves what we're doing. So let's break it down. So verse 4 says you are not to answer the fool according to his folly. The reason given is that you will be like him yourself if you do that. So how can you be like a, a, a fool in answering a fool according to his folly? How can you be like a fool? Think about this a little bit. What would you have to do? You'd have to start reasoning like him, wouldn't you? Exactly. You would have to follow his futile, do you remember that word? His futile train of thought. Okay? If you adopt his futile train of thought or his futile perspective, his futile worldview, you will be like him. You will come out into the same sorts of irrationality and meaninglessness that he does. He doesn't think he comes out in irrationality and meaninglessness unless he's a modern philosopher. Normally people don't think about that very much, although um, unthinking students nowadays think it's cool to say there is no such thing as truth, you know. And they're getting there. And then they go to their car and they drive back to their house. And, uh, you know, they kiss their dog and they go to their bank for their bank account because all of those things are necessarily true things for them. So every time that they turn around, they kind of disprove their no such thing as truth viewpoint. But most people who adopt these non-Christian worldviews, they don't see the irrationality of those worldviews. And the reason is that they can get by 
with their non-Christian worldviews as long as they don't look too deeply. It's kind of like, you know, the cartoon character, uh, you know, who, uh, you know, um, Wiley Coyote dashes off the cliff. And uh, for a while, you know, he's running and so on, and he's, he's fine. He's, he's in thin air, but he's fine until he stops and he looks down, and then he looks at the camera, and then he drops, doesn't he? Yes? Once he realizes that he doesn't have anything underneath him, you know, it all comes apart. Well, that's what, uh, that's what unsafe people are like. They don't realize that they're kind of running on nothing. There's no foundation underneath their feet. Uh, Van Til, who's apologetic we're dealing with here, he had th these really um, interesting um, illustrations that he used. One of them was that he described a, an unsafe person as a man of water trying to climb out of the water on a ladder of water. Just think about that for a minute. He's a man of water trying to climb out of the water on a ladder of water. In other words, it's completely pointless. I mean, he can't do it. You see? And if we try to adopt the world's way of thinking, the world's way of reasoning, trying to seek a neutral buffer zone, we will be like that. We will be like him. So that's what this first part is telling us. It's warning us not to enter into his way of thinking as our way of thinking. Do you understand? Now that straight away is going to stop you from sitting down with a cup of coffee in Starbucks with an unsafe person and pretending that you're just going to argue to the truth of Christianity, okay? You're just going to have this rational discussion. Okay? You're not going to do it. He's not going to do it either. You might think you're doing it, but you will not do it. You have to realize that you're coming from two different perspectives. Um, next verse, at first seems to contradict it, because it says, answer a fool. Well, do you answer a fool or do you not answer a fool? Because verse 4 tells you not to answer a fool. This one's telling you to answer a fool. Answer a fool according to his folly. So you are to answer a fool according to his folly. Why? So he isn't wise in his own eyes. You see, this is, unbelievers think this, they're wise in their unbelief. They think they have good reasons for not believing in God. They think they have good reasons for rejecting the fact that they're sinners, that this world is not created by God. Why? Well, because from their foolish perspective, okay, which doesn't look very critically at their foundation from their worldview that's superficially the way it is I mean for example um, look, let's 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 think about this so do you have to be an unbeliever to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Do you have to be an unbeliever to believe that? Or, or do you have to be a believer to believe that? No. You can be believer or unbeliever, and you can believe in 2 plus 2 equals 4, can't you? Everyone knows that. Yeah? So, why can't we agree then get together and agree that uh, from my worldview, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and from their worldview, 2 plus 2 equals 4. 
superficially, 2 plus 2 equals 4 from their worldview because they're not examining their worldview. You ever run into these people that say, unless I can touch it, you know, taste it, feel it, hear it, smell it, I won't believe it? Now, those people shouldn't be using numbers then. But they do use numbers. Do you see? So, try and account for numbers from a biblical worldview. You believe in God, okay? So, where do you think numbers come from? Numbers are invisible. Now, where do you think they could come from? He made them up. Well, no, no you're getting there. Okay, here's my cup, okay? Is my cup capable of making up numbers? Why not? Is my dog that has a brain capable of making up numbers? Why not? Okay, are you capable of, of thinking of numbers? Okay, why? Ah! See, the biblical worldview provides you with the answer, doesn't it? Okay, because you think and you've been given this ability to, to reason, okay, because you're made in the image of God and God and God's mind is the source, the origin for numbers. So when people use numbers, they are using the gifts of God which are telling them about God. But of course, people use numbers like unbelievers and they say, I can use numbers. Two plus two equals four. But in their worldview, yes, two plus two equals four, but in their worldview has no explanation for numbers. Do you see? Has no, no explanation. If, if all we are is, my, is sorry, mindless matter, purposeless matter in motion, every number that I know of comes from mind. Yes? Minds create numbers or think of numbers. Same as every law of thought requires a thinker. But if we come from random chaos that is thoughtless, that is, you know, not rational, is, is irrational, how do you account for the laws of logic? Which are also what? Yeah, they're mind. They are non-physical things. They are invisible things, aren't they? But you have to use them. Every time a person uses numbers, every time a person uses the laws of logic, for example, if they are not a believer, they are, as it were, using God's good gifts, which are right there in front of them, telling them that God exists. And by not thinking about it, reflecting about it, and by ignoring it and using them anyway, and then saying God doesn't exist, they're condemning themselves. Do you see? This is why Romans 1, 18 through 32 says, doesn't mention the gospel. It says that when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Professing themselves to be wise, because they do, they became fools. You can use numbers... Okay, the same way as an unsafe person can use numbers, but you have a worldview that accounts for numbers. They don't. Two people, and there's a crime. So the police inspector comes along and he interviews the first person. The first person gives an account of where they are. Okay? The other person doesn't have an account of where they were because they did it. All right? But what they do is they say, they borrow from this person's account. They listen to this person. They say, oh, I was there too. Do you see? 
they're borrowing from that person's account. They don't have one of their own. That's what unsafe people do with things like logic and numbers and well, actually everything else, science, their creativity. So these things are all part of our personhood and they're explained by the biblical worldview. They're not explained by other worldviews. Okay. So you answer a fool according to his folly. You enter into his, um, his foolish way of thinking for argument's sake to show him that if you persist in looking at the world and thinking like this, your argument makes sense of nothing. You have nothing to ground this on. And so where are you getting this stuff from? You're actually borrowing it from the Christian worldview. And the reason you have to borrow it from the Christian worldview is because the Christian worldview is the only true worldview. It's the one that is the account of reality. Do you see? Nod your heads or do something. So I know that you're paying attention. Do you believe that this book is by the one who made all things and upholds all things and describes these things? And they are what they are depending on what he wants them to do. Remember my little scrungeet thing. I didn't bring it to tonight, but I'll bring it again. That precision instrument thing that I handed around, I've got no idea what that thing is. But I could make something up. But if my, uh, my description of it doesn't match what it really is, I'm wrong. Because there's only one real reality of what that is. There's only one true description. And that's the description of the person that made it. It's the same with the world, folks. It's the same with you. You want to know what you are, you've got to go to the creator who tells you what you are. Or you go to the world and the world will tell you what you are, but they'll be wrong. You can believe them, but you will find that your, your life is not very satisfying and you don't have answers to the big questions. And if you dig deep, you'll find nothing. So remember this procedure, this kind of two-step. You're not to step into the unbeliever's worldview. That is a big, big mistake that Christians make because they think that this person's neutral and so I'll just be neutral and we'll get to the truth that way. They're not, and you shouldn't be. But you say, well, for argument's sake, you tell me what you believe about reality. You tell me what you believe about, about yourself, about the world. You'll see that they really don't have, they've not really thought about it. <laughs> they don't really have many uh, deep answers for this. Um, I was in a debate some years back with uh, an atheist and it, we were kind of, this person accused me of stole, stonewalling, okay? In other words, of, of not dealing with the, the, the arguments, the big arguments. So I started to deal with them and I started to talk about, well, from a, I am a Christian by the grace of God. I believe the Bible is the word of God and a correct description of reality. Um, I know you don't, I understand that you don't, but what's your view of reality? Now, I couldn't get this person to tell me, so what I did is I tried to help them, and I, I gave, and I, I will hand this out at some point, I gave them a description of uh, 
things like where does logic come from? Where does numbers f come from? Uh, how do we? Uh, how come we can do science? How come there is uniformity in nature? Okay, so we can repeat things. Um, our artistic abilities. Okay, love. Uh, wickedness. Violence. I mean, where do all these things, how do you account for these things in your worldview? And I, I sent it to her and said, okay, let's see yours. She never repl replied to that. I mean, she kept on arguing. And I said, where is your account of reality? You, you can't agree with mine because I've traced all of mine back to God and given you reasons why it's God. You reject God. So where do you base all of these things? She would not tell me. She just continued to use these numbers, laws of thought, and so on. I said, but you need to give an account for laws of thought. That's what I'm challenging you to do. Okay? She said, I don't need to give an account. I said, you think you don't need to give an account for these things because you think you're neutral. But if you stop lying to yourself and actually start doing what I've challenged you to do, you'll see that you cannot give an account of them. And if you can't give an account of them of, in your worldview, what do you need to do with your worldview? What do you need to do with it? throw it out because it's useless. It doesn't account for reality. And you need to get a worldview that does account for reality. That's the Christian worldview, the one that re you're rejecting. And the reason you're rejecting it is also given in the Bible. So the Bible accounts also not only for the foolishness of other worldviews, it accounts for why people hold those worldviews. Sin, rebellion from God, independence. Do you see? So then it, you go straight to sin, do you see? The reason you will not do this is the, what the Bible calls sin. You're in rebellion to God. You're in rebellion to the one who is actually upholding you right now. And you're using his good gifts to argue against him. How do you think you'll fare when you meet him? I've got to rely on the Holy Spirit to do the work of conviction. I can't do that, but I, what I can do is I can stay within my God-honoring view of reality and show that unbeliever their view of reality doesn't make sense. Just like the Bible says it doesn't make sense, it's futile. And call them to repentance. What's repentance mean, do you know? doesn't mean turn necessarily. There is a word that can mean that, but metanoia really means to change your mind. Okay, to change your mind. Every one of us, when we became a Christian, we changed our mind about God. We changed our mind about the Bible. We changed our mind because of, we believed now in the God of the Bible. We changed our mind about ourselves. We changed our mind about what the world is, didn't we? And sometimes we forget that we did that. But we did. We turn from a um, futile way of thinking about things into to the truth, to the light. Okay. So... Let me kind of illustrate here a little bit of what's going on by pointing out another thing here that we're dealing with. Don't forget this stuff. But we'll keep this one up. <clears throat> I'm going to put another fancy word up here. Antithesis. Have you heard that word before? You say, why do we have to use these fancy words? Well, the thing is, if we're going to think 
Okay, we need to learn some vocabulary. You know what, what gets me, all right? That most people nowadays, they can rattle off these um, prescription drugs that they, can, they get from the doctor, the oxycodone, oxyacetylene, whatever they are, um, drugs, just as if it's nothing. Why? Because it's important to them. Okay? But they don't want to learn um, theological terminology. They don't need to learn all of it, but just some of it. So they, it puts a, an impression in their minds of what it is. Okay? Antithesis is another one of these words that's helpful for us. Okay? When we say that something is antithetical to something else, what do we mean? Do you know? It's opposing, yes. It opposes it. Okay? So that's all we mean here by uh, antithesis. There is an antithesis, an opposition of worldviews. The biblical worldview as opposed to every other worldview. You have to pay attention to the antithesis. You have to keep it in your mind. If you don't, you will enter into their worldview. So when you are talking with an unbeliever, you have to remember there's an antithesis. And we've already looked at this. I mean, in, um, if you want to look again in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, I mean, it's all over the place in the Bible. It's the right there in Proverbs 26. In fact, it's all over Proverbs. Where is the, where is the, where is the antithesis in Proverbs? Between the what person and the other person? The wise person. the wise person and the fool. That's an antithesis, isn't it? The wise person does not have the same perspective as the fool does. The fool has a silly perspective. The lazy person has a different perspective than the diligent person, don't they? There's an antithesis between them. The Christian, the Bible-believing Christian, does not come from the same perspective as non-Christians. There's an antithesis between them. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 now this I say to you, verse 17, testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. That's an, in an antithesis right there. John chapter 3. Well, I'll just quote it. John, uh, Jesus says, uh, light has come into the world, verse 19 and following. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and they would not come to the light. That is an antithesis, do you see? Light and darkness. That's what we're talking about here. I mean, you come across these passages all the time when you read the Bible, but then we pass over them. And we think that, okay, well, uh, the Bible's just saying that, you know, we've received the light because we've been saved and we know we're going to heaven and we believe the gospel and that's all there is to it. But there's much more to it. A real change has occurred. Colossians 1 puts it this way, that we have been... Uh, transferred or translated out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of his dear son. Yeah? You see, you see this all the time. It's, it's throughout the scripture, this antithesis. So let's uh, kind of read from somebody who describes this. This is from Greg Barnson. And uh, I want to read you a little bit from here. I hope you don't mind. 
This is from his book Presuppositional Apologetics, pages 46 and following. Because the unbeliever's knowledge of God is suppressed, where do you get that from? Or where does he get that from? Romans. No points for John. Romans chapter 1, yes. Verses 18 and following. Because the unbeliever's knowledge of God is suppressed, yet still present. It's just holding it down. But the believer's knowledge of God is openly acknowledged when it's used properly. There is a definite antithesis between the thinking or philosophy of the Christian and that of the non-Christian. To some extent, this has already been discussed, he says. The unbeliever does not begin his reasoning with the truth of Christ's word, while the believer does, unless you're using a faulty view of apologetics. And then you don't. And there's a problem there, do you see? But you should always argue from the light you've been saved into. If you give up the foundation for... Um, for thought then it's going to be very hard <laughs> to go outside of it to argue back to it, do you see? In fact, it's going to be impossible unless you're actually assuming it all, all the time you're just not telling people that you are in that case you're being disingenuous you're telling people we'll just argue to a God but you're not really arguing to a God. You're actually arguing to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're just not telling people you're doing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although the sinner can never escape knowing the truth of God's revelation in his heart of hearts, still he does not openly and self-consciously base his public philosophizing upon Scripture. He's using that term. He just means thinking about life. The believer has a genuine and proper knowledge of the Lord, but the unbeliever is lost in foolishness because he misuses and suppresses the clear revelation of God. Notice that he's not just suppressing it, he's also abusing it. He's misusing it. Just like an unsaved, people, an unsaved person misuses the laws of logic to argue against God. But how does he account for the laws of logic that he's using to argue against God? See, there's where we're arguing. If you're joining him at his level of argumentation, just presupposing I can use the laws of logic, then you're on his ground. Do you see? So you say, hold on a minute. You're using the laws of logic, but you can't ac ac account for the laws of logic in your worldview. Give an account of it because I know you can use it, um, give an account of it, and then we, we can discuss. And he'll say, well, of course, we have to both use the same laws of logic, don't we? And you say, no, because from my worldview, I can account for the laws of logic. And from my worldview, you can't account for the laws of logic. And when you find that you can't account for the, using the laws of logic, you should come over to my worldview. Do you see? You're misusing the laws of logic. It's like, again, Van Til gave this illustration of a buzzsaw that's set at the right, it cuts brilliantly, just set to the wrong setting. So it always cuts askew. That's what the human, the unsaved mind's like. It looks at reality, or it cuts through reality, but just cuts it in the, in the wrong way. In the apologetical argument that arises between these two, there will be a direct clash of espoused presuppositions. A clash. There will be a head-on collision. The problem you're going to have is getting that person to even think that they have presuppositions. Okay? You have to be upfront. Of course I have presuppositions. Of course I have bias. But so do you. I'm going to go more into that. 
The presuppositions of the Christian are rooted in Scripture, but those of the unbeliever rebel against Scripture. By observing the antithesis as Scripture presents it, the apologist will be shown that he must not depend upon the presuppositional presuppositions of secular philosophy and science in constructing his defense of the faith. Rather, his argumentation must be firmly established on the word of Christ and must, be bold, must boldly challenge the non-Christian from within that position. You do not move from the scripture. You don't argue to the scripture. There will be times, and we'll look at it later on, where we will talk about, okay, how do we know that the Bible hasn't been changed and all of that stuff. But that right now is not, if you, you can argue with a person like that forever and he'll always be able to bring up another issue, which is a loophole for why he shouldn't believe. You don't argue with a person like that. You argue uh, with worldviews. Okay, the biblical worldview against all of the others. <clears throat> because there is a striking contrast between the presuppositioning, presuppositions excuse me, and reasoning of the unbeliever and those of the believer, it requires a dramatic intellectual transition for one to leave the kingdom of darkness and enter the kingdom of God's beloved Son. That's what we call conversion. And then he says here, um, Jesus asserts in John 17 that God's word is truth. Consequently, Christians are set apart from the world by the word of God. And having this status, they are sent into the world. As we walk before the unbeliever then, the thing that makes us different is our submission to the word of God. Our lives and thinking are founded on Scripture while the essence of the unbeliever's life is rejection of the revelation of God. Do you see the antithesis there? Our lives and thinking. Thinking, 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 thinking. Not just lovey-dovey devotionals, folks. Okay? You think like a Christian, you think biblically. This is why doctrine's so important. Doctrine's so important that there's a verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, that says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, or is God breathed, and is profitable for what? Doctrine. doctrine, first thing. But for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be uh, thoroughly furnished out to all good works. Now, the thing is, you cannot be admonished, you can't be instructed or reproved if you don't have doctrine. Doctrine must come first, otherwise the man of God can't be, um, can't be made. We're failing everyone. In our programs and all that stuff. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's universal. It's universal and has been for a long time. And uh, we might be able to talk a little bit about that um, if we can get through this material. So when the Christian uses the presuppositions dictated by the world in his apologetic, he has moved over into the realm of error. And uh, just a few pages on, just quote this to you. Barnson says, If then the apologist is required by God's word to presuppose the authority of Scripture's self-attesting truth, he is obligated not to bring that word into question. You don't question the Bible. Why? Because the Bible's your final authority. Okay, we'll, get, we'll come back to that in a minute. 
Okay, moving on. So this is another Barnes and book. This is an excellent book. It's called Always Ready. Okay, this is the book that I would recommend if you want to really understand um, this, you know, in a, a, a biblical way to, to see how the Bible continually teaches the antithesis. This Greg Barnson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. Okay, and I'm just reading a little bit here. The, here he's going to go through what we talked about in Proverbs 26, okay? In Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, we are instructed as to how we should answer the foolish unbeliever, how we should demonstrate that God makes foolish the so-called wisdom of this world. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou be lest he be wise in his own conceit. The twofold apologetic procedure mentioned by Van Til above is here described. In the first place, the unbeliever should not be answered in terms of his own misguided presuppositions. You don't enter into his worldview. The apologist should defend his faith by working within his, the apologist's own presuppositions. <coughs> if Excuse me. He surrenders to the assumptions of the unbeliever. The believer will never effectively set forth a reason for the hope that is in him. How can he? You've gone and left that behind. But that's what you're supposed to be doing in apologetics, according to First Timothy, First Peter three fifteen. In the second place, the apologist should answer the fool according to his self-proclaimed presuppositions, that is, according to his folly. In so doing, he aims to show the unbeliever the outcome of those assumptions. Pursued to their consistent end, presuppositions of unbelief render man's reasoning vacuous and his experience unintelligible. In short, they lead to the destruction of knowledge the dead end of epistemological futility to utter foolishness. Epistemological futility just means thinking, okay? <clears throat> so remember the antithesis and push it. Push it on the unbeliever. I'm from this position. I know you're not, but I am. I'm a Christian. I can't not be a Christian. I am a Christian. You're an unbeliever, so I don't expect you to hold my view. If you did, you would be a Christian. So from my perspective, this is what I am as a human being. I am, first of all, made in the image of God. I'm valuable. I'm worth something. I have a purpose. I have a meaning. Do you see? I'm not just a cosmic accident. I didn't spring up from slime, you know, through um, fauna and fish and reptiles and, and monkeys and apes into what I am now. And I'm not part of some kind of chaotic, mindless process of deterministic evolution. I've got a purpose as a human being. I've also got a soul. I'm not my body is not all there is to me. I'm not a machine. My thoughts are my own thoughts. I have a mind, and my mind is not dictated by the firing of neurons in my brain. I have a soul made in the image of God. And, uh, but I'm fallen. I'm a sinner. So are you. And remember what the key um, view of the sinner is? Do you remember that? Went to Genesis 3. What's Eve's problem? No. Nope. No, but it's more basic than that. She what? Thank you. Thank you. Two points over there. Um, she wanted to think independently of the word of God. 
Do you remember that? That's our propensity right now. That's why it's so hard to obey this book. That's why it's so easy to do our own thing. Because our default is to be independent from the Word of God. Yes? Faith, yes. <laughs> faith is what makes us dependent on the Word of God. That's what faith is. It's not just this airy-fairy thing that the world talks about. Okay, we're going to get onto the, into that as well. Independence, okay? They are independent. We have a propensity to be, to be independent. So when we remember the antithesis, we remember that we should be dependent. And we stick to the worldview that we've been called to. We stay inside the light, do you see? All right. I'll give you an example now. And I'm going through these just so, um, I, I hope that these kind of are illustrative and uh, helps us save a little time. This is uh, Scott Oliphant and his book Covenantal Apologetics. This is a bit more advanced. But here he's giving us an example of the antithesis that we've been talking about. And he's also giving us an example here of uh, entering into the folly of the fool. So watch out for this here. We're, he's going to start with a quotation from Daniel Dennett. Daniel Dennett is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as they call themselves, one of these new atheists, okay? Daniel Dennett believes that we are machines. We are just naturalistic machines. He does not believe in consciousness, okay? He does not believe that we're conscious in the way that traditionally we believe we're conscious. Okay? He believes that our consciousness is an illusion that's fobbed off on us by our genes. As uh, I think it's Dawkins once said, we dance to the tune of our DNA. Okay? So we're, we're completely determined. Your thoughts, your deeds are completely determined. You are just a, an advanced robot. That's what, um, by the way, you go to university, you go to psychology classes, that's what you'll get taught. Okay? Um, so let me read this uh, passage from Daniel Dennett and then just some of the answers that Oliphant gives. Okay? Quote. The philosopher Ronald de Souza once memorably described philosophical theology as, quote, an intellectual tennis without a net. And I readily allow that I have indeed been assuming, without comment or question up to now, that the net of rational judgment was up. But we can lower it if you really want to. It's your serve. Whatever you serve, Suppose I return service rudely as follows, quote, What you say implies that God is a ham sandwich wrapped in tin foil. That's how much of a God to worship. If you then volley back demanding to know how I can logically justify my claim that your serve has such a preposterous implication, I will reply, Oh, do you want the net up for my returns, but not for your serves? Either the net stays up or it stays down. If the net is down, and what is the net? The net of rational judgment, remember? If the net is down, there are no rules and anybody can say anything. I have been giving you the benefit of the assumption that you would not waste your own time or mine by playing with the net down. Now, if you want to reason about faith and offer a reasoned and reason-responsive defensive of faith as an extra category of belief worthy of special consideration, I am eager to play. I certainly grant the existence of the phenomenon of faith. What I want to see is a reasoned ground for taking faith seriously as a way of getting to the truth. 
but you must not expect me to go along with your defense of faith as a path to truth if at any point you appeal to the very dispensation you are supposedly trying to justify. Before you appeal to faith, when reason has backed you into a corner, think about whether you really want to abandon reason when reason is on your side. And he continues. The ball is now on your court. Okay, what is going on here is that Dennett, like lots of atheists, um, is saying, look, you believe in faith. Okay, I believe in reason. So when we're going to have a discussion about what you, you believe, okay, are we going to have the net of reason, rational argumentation up or not? Or do you just want to play this fairy tennis without the, the net up? Do you see? Because if you want to reason about it, the net's got to come up. And the, uh, the implication is that the person with faith, because that's all they have, as opposed to reason, every time they serve, the net of reason is going to catch their serve and going to catch their tennis balls. Do you see? That's how unbelievers think about Christianity. Unfortunately, that's even how some Christians think about Christianity. It's just faith. And we'll get into faith and reason um, starting next week when we start to talk about science. <clears throat> now remember the antithesis, okay? <clears throat> Thank you for your clarity. Let me first say that there is much of substance on which you and I can agree. Specifically, I too am seriously trying to get to the truth in this discussion. Are you interested in the truth or not? Do you think Christianity is true? I mean, is it a description of reality or is it just a kind of personal truth, which is what a lot of Christians make it? Okay, I mean, my son's over here, your daughters, okay? If we're not careful, they'll grow up thinking that Christianity is just some personal little belief that they can hold on to and has nothing to do with the outside world. And when they hit the outside world, they'll think, I don't need this. All right, it doesn't, it's no use. It doesn't fit. We're concerned with truth, or we're not concerned at all. If Christianity isn't true, then to blazes with it. It's got to be true, or it's utterly useless. But he says here, this is the apologist, but you and I have an initial problem that must be addressed, and it is manifest in your illustration. In speaking of the net of rational judgment, you think that there are only two options. Either the net is up or the net is down. Now, see, what he's doing is that he's, he's not allowing this person to set the rules. Okay? Net up, net down. So he's entering into... He's staying in his own Christian worldview, but he's entering into that person's worldview and he's showing him that he's not biased. <clears throat> when the net is up, rational judgment is in play. When it is down, anything goes, including your postulation that God is a ham sandwich wrapped in tin foil. To put the net down, you think, is to open the game up to such absurdities. So we've got to have, if we want a rational argument, the net's got to be up. The problem, however, which you have not recognized is the problem of the net itself. Not whether it's up or down. The problem of the net itself. The net that you propose to use for our verbal volley is not one that I myself am able to use in your game. I cannot use it, not because I'm opposed to rational judgment, 
but because what you think is rational judgment is in fact a judgment that precludes, that means shuts out, my position. He's pointing out that he's not biased, you see? Or that he's not unbiased. See, what's he trying to do? He's this, the unbeliever is trying to set the rules of the game, the rules of the argument. He wants to bring the believer into his worldview and discuss it there. The unbeliever cannot do that. Okay? He cannot do that. You have argued elsewhere that my religious commitment is a natural phenomenon. That's what he believes. Your religious belief is just going to explain by your DNA. You've been wired to believe in God like kids are wired to believe in Santa Claus. Do you see? So whatever the net of rational judgment is, it must include the fact of my commitment as is simply more of your own naturalism. In other words, he's defining the net as naturalism only. Okay? Rational judgment is defined by what's natural. Well, he's a naturalist. So his net, let's, I'm a brilliant artist. So um, his net Okay, just like that, that's what they look like. <clears throat> Can you see it? Uh, this is a, so there's a tennis player over here. Hi. And there's one over here. Oh, you got a tennis racket, whatever. But, <laughs> um, so here's the unbeliever, okay, and he's put his net up. But the net okay, is for well, naturalism only. Anything that's supernatural is going to get caught in the net. Anything that's natural, anything that he serves, because he's defined um, rationalism as being only what is natural, that's going to get over the net. He's, what's he doing? He's rigging the game. Do you see? He's rigging the game. You've got to push the antithesis. You say, no, look, you are presupposing that naturalism's right. I don't hold that view. If we held, both held that view, we could play by your rules. But I don't hold that view. So I'm not going to play by your rules because you don't define reason. Not only do you not define reason, but by naturalism, you have no foundation for reason. Which we will get to, by the way, when we got to Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism, which we'll get to. Um, but a person that just believes that you believe what you believe and you believe what you believe just because of the firing of neurons in your brain at this particular time, okay, that's the only thing. Your consciousness is just an illusion, doesn't really exist. If you really believe that, then obviously there's no reason to believe that anything you say is true. Or rational, because you're going to think it's rational. G.K. Chesterton has this wonderful passage about, um, you know, mad men. He talks about, um, in his book Orthodox, he talks about that uh, mad men tend to be people who are hyper-rational, but rational on one thing, okay? They just focus on one thing and they're hyper-rational about it. It doesn't tend to be, says the artists and the poets that go mad. It's the hyper-rationalists that go mad. And um, the thing is that if you 
uh, every mad person believes they're what? Sane. You see? They believe they're sane. So, just like an unbeliever, just like Daniel Dennett here, who believes that his thoughts actually are not his thoughts, they're just the way that his, his uh, neurons are firing at any particular time, it's actually crazy belief, isn't it? Because why would he even write a book to persuade people to do it and actually believe that what he was doing was rational? Surely you'd have to believe that whether it was rational or not, he was just predetermined to do it. Rationalism has got nothing to do with, with, uh, with it. Why would he want to put a, a rationalistic net? Am I getting ahead here, or do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's move on a little bit here. You are anxious to have the net up, Oliphant says, as long as the net contains only those principles that you claim to be rational. But if that is the case, then surely the game is fixed from the beginning. That's the unbeliever's bias. He thinks he's neutral, but he's not. What I think is rational, because of my authority for thinking such things, is going to be substantially different from what you think is rational. So the options are not, as you imply in your net illustration, either rational judgment or absurdity. Rather, we have to determine just how we think about rationality itself. So he's, not, he's refusing to say, oh yeah, let's have, just have a rational argument. No, he's saying, hold on a minute. Let's talk about rationality. Let's start there. How come you can use rationality in the first place? Where do you get rationality from in your worldview? Like, where do you get numbers from when you believe, for example, that the only thing that exists is matter in motion. Well, numbers aren't material. So if you really, really, really believed that the only thing that we can believe in is material, physical things, you can't believe in numbers, can you? Do you see that? That's what he's saying. Let's stop at rationality and let's examine how I what, what my view of rationality is and your view of rationality because we have different views of rationality and I'm not playing by your rules and I know you're not going to play by, me, by mine. Straight away, what the Christian is doing is saying, yeah, I'm biased and so are you. Now, perhaps you can see that this is exactly what you have done in requiring that your net be used in our discussion. If I might apply your own criterion against you, you yourself have appealed to the very dispensation you are supposedly trying to justify. You have appealed to a net that defines the rational naturalistically. And then you have urged me to make sense of my faith within it. No tennis player worth his salt would venture onto a court with such a net. If the opponent's net excludes his contender at the outset, the game is over before it begins. And then just one final thing here. Um, I agree, however, that we're, we're seriously trying to get at the truth here. So as we debate the composition of our respective nets, that is rationality, let me try to meet your request to, quote, see a reason ground for taking faith seriously as a way of getting to the truth. You will concede, I hope then, that the question at hand is not who is the more rational according to my criteria of rationality, but rather which view explains the data before us. See, they, the world wants to argue on its own rules. It wants to rig the game. 
It wants to say that your Christian faith is just something nice little kind of prop that you use a nice something belief that's fuzzy and comfortable and gets you through life, yeah? But here in the rational world, you know, we don't need that. Well, you cannot accept that view of reality because that view of reality doesn't work. It's not reality, actually. It's one of those, you know, people in thin air, you know, not looking down. You've got to show, get them to look down. And you cannot do that with, when you're doing this on thin air too. All right, what time are we on? Okay, we're getting there. Um, so there's always a clash of worldviews, always. When you're talking to an unbeliever, have it in your head that you have your Christian worldview, they're not going to share it, and they have theirs. I remember some years ago I was talking to a lady on an airplane, and she was pro-abortion and all this sort of thing, and we were talking about abortion. And um, I said, well, I'm a Christian. And I said, I, my view is that God is the creator of human life and is the creator of everything and therefore every human life has an intrinsic worth. So obviously I oppose abortion on that viewpoint. And she, of course she said, well what about those women that are raped? And what I said, look, that is about point whatever, point five of one percent of all of the abortions. So just for sake of argument, I'll give you that. Now let's talk about the 99%. 99% of the cases, it has to do with uh, sex outside of marriage or sex in marriage where the husband or the wife or both of them don't want to look after the child and they want to abort it. There's no question about what is it. I remember Greg Kokel saying once uh, years ago, he says, uh, just imagine a child came up to a mother in a, in a kitchen, she had her back turned, and he said, can I kill this? Well, the mother wants to know what it is. If it's a bug, okay, you know. If it's a snake, yeah. What if it's the dog? See, you've got to know what it is before you know whether you can kill it. What is a baby? What is a, um, a baby in the womb? Is it a creation of God? See, is it a life? Or is it just a piece of naturalistic nothing? Well, more and more, our technology is actually showing that it's not a blob, is it? Okay? In ultrasounds, you know, you can see that after a very short time, that's not a blob there. It's got a heart. It's, all, it's got all the DNA that it will ever have. And it's not the mother's DNA. So, you know, the argument that a woman should be able to do what she wants with her own body, if she wants to abort her own body, I guess, you know, that's kind of stupid. But go ahead and do it. Just don't abort somebody else's body, which is the baby. Do you see? Anyway, wh why am I going there? Again, worldviews are important. That kind of argument is actually an, uh, an example of pushing the antithesis here. Not using the abortion arguments of the world, not using their net. <clears throat> All right, one more little reading here. I hope you don't mind. I've tried not to do this too much. This is from David Bentley Hart, a book called Atheist Delusions. And by the way, I've, um, I've reviewed these two books on my blog, if you want more in-depth stuff on it but um, 
This is from a different angle, but I think hopefully you'll see how it relates. He's talking about history. Okay, history. And he says this. To believe in history is to assume that human time obeys a certain narrative logic, one that accommodates both disjunction and resolution and that moves toward an end quite different from its beginning. This we do not find among the pagans. The only philosophy of history known to antiquity was one that simply assimilated history to nature, its cycles and repetitions, a vast regularity punctuated by chance upheavals. Which is to say that from a philosophical perspective, history and nature alike shared in the same ultimate meaninglessness. And he continues, for the late Platonists, for example, everything subject to change here below in the region of dissimilitude was at best a dim and distant reflection of an order of eternal splendors, which was the true homeland of the spirit and to which the mind could rise only to the degree that it was divested itself of mutability and contingency. That is changing, changing and um, you know, the uh, contingencies of, of uh, the world. One's inmost identity was pure intellection, just thinking about things. They wouldn't focus on things outside. As, however, further down, the pagan mythos was displaced by the Christian and Christianity's immense epic of creation and salvation, never forget the doctrine of creation, became for ancient men and women the one true story of the world, the conceptual shape of reality necessarily changed for them as well. For common believers, Christ's victory, his triumph over the powers of the air, the elemental spirits, the devils, death itself, had purged the natural world of its more terrifying mysteries and tamed its more impulsive spiritual agencies. They were scared to death, remember, the ancients of uh, the spirits. They would placate their gods. Okay, so it changed the world. They, never, they no longer saw the world as bewitched, in a sense. For the more educated and philosophically inclined, the doctrine of creation ex nihila, that is from nothing, by God's free action, raised the principle of divine transcendence, creator creature distinction, remember, to an altogether different height. It produced a vision of this world as the gratuitous gift of divine love good in itself, not merely the defective reflection of a higher, truer world, not a necessary emanation of the divine nature or a sacrificial economy upon which the, div the divine in some sense feeds, but an internally coherent reality that by its very autonomy gives eloquent witness to the beauty and power of the God who made it. Now, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but folks, if you got any of that, what uh, Hart was saying is that from a Christian standpoint, the world looks different. Don't go back into the pagan worldview. Don't go into the Platonic worldview, okay, and argue with a Platonist who believed that this world is actually just a defective, sinful, secondary world. The real one is the world of spirit up there, okay? That was Plato's philosophy. You can't, you know, if you argue like that, he'll beat you on his, on his ground. You say, no, this world is a creation by a good God, not by an evil God, which is what Plato believed and the Gnostics. Don't go in with the pan panentheists. Don't go in with the New Agers who believe that Mother Earth, you know, we're all growing together, we're all one. We are the world and all of that. Um, 
don't go in with them believing that rot. Okay? No, this planet, okay, is made for us. We image God on it. We're fallen though. The problem with the world is that we need to uh, realize that we're fallen and we need to go back to God and be proper custodians of the world that is God's. And so Hart is saying, you approach the unbeliever from within your worldview. You only step into their worldview to do what? Show them their folly. That's right. Say, so, okay, and in order to do, that, to do that, you have to ask questions. Okay, you have to say, well, say what? So you want to be rational. You want to use a rational net, okay? But it's only a naturalistic net because you don't believe in supernaturalism. So it's an atheistic evolutionist, okay? So from your, ra your naturalism, how do you account for wanting to use the net anyway? And how do you know that your position is rational? Surely it's just as irrational as my position. Because you're saying that what um, my position is, is just the firing of neurons in my brain. But yours is just the firing of neurons in your brain, according to you. So neither of us can help the views that we hold. So what's the point of even debating about it? The debate is not about anything, is it? It's like, as uh, Doug Wilson says, it's like having two cans of, of uh, pop and opening them up and let them froth at each other. I mean, that's all that's going on, isn't it? There's no meaning if you really believe this stuff. So why have a net in the first place, do you see? You get entering into their worldview to show them the folly of their worldview. And then you're saying, look, from my worldview, why don't you enter into my worldview? I know you don't believe it, but just see it from my perspective for a bit. From my perspective, um, rationality is always comes from minds, okay? I'm not the source of rationality, you're not the source of rationality. The laws of thought are, are non-corporeal, which means they're not material. They come from God, who is the eternal mind, the eternal, uh, eternally existent one, who has made everything and who holds everything up. That means everything has intrinsic value, everything has purpose, everything actually has a definition, but that definition is with God. And only when we, our definition agrees with God's definition do we have truth. Only when we're using our rational faculties in line with what God has made the world for, which is why, by the way, our rational faculties line up with the world, okay, do we have, again, truth and do we have actual rationality? Otherwise, we are using the laws of logic wrongly. And by the way, we, we do that all the time. If I'm found out or if I'm too proud and arrogant to admit that I've done something wrong, I can use the laws of logic to argue my way out of what I know I've done. And so can you. Okay? As the old saw is, um, is that uh, you can't under, you know, husbands can't understand their wives, you know, they can't understand their, her logic just is like, I don't know where she gets that from, you know, it's like a different planet. Okay, and she's probably thinking the same thing. Well, they're both probably using the laws of thought, but they're not using it in reliance upon this book. They're not trying to come to this book, they're actually going away from the book in order to not be held culpable for what they've done. Not for what somebody else has done, but for what they are responsible for. So we do it all the time. If we do it in things like that, if we do it when it comes to, have you eaten two cookies? When I told you to eat one cookie? 
oh no, I haven't. And then you explain, you try and use the laws of logic to explain why you haven't used, you haven't, sorry, got two cookies, even though you know you've got two cookies. If we can do it there, we can do it with whether God exists or not. Whether our reasoning just comes from evolutionary forces or not. We can misuse the gifts of God. And that is culpable. That's culpable. God will judge people that do that because their worldview cannot support it. So the antithesis here is essential. The last thing is I wrote this up on the board, the impossibility of contrary views. We'll go more into this next time. It's sometimes called the impossibility of the contrary. But when I say that, a lot of people think, what does that mean? That sounds too, you know, like, like a brain fog comes over people. So I put impossibility of contrary views. And I hope that I've explained what I mean here by that. The only uh, view of reality that's actually possible, that actually explains, and I mean when you look deep down, okay? When you ask why, how come, and so on. How do you explain that? Where's that come from? When you start asking those questions, only biblical, uh, Judeo-biblical, um, or Judeo-Christian, sorry, worldviews account for that. The others do not account for them. The only worldview that makes sense of reality and therefore of, you know, the world that we live in is the Christian worldview. The others are excluded. So you show a person, basically what you're striving at is to show them the impossibility of explaining themselves and explaining the world outside of the Christian worldview. Just like the impossibility of using a rationalistic net. Any questions? Don't you wish, without knocking anyone, and really, I don't mean to knock anyone, I'm being general. Don't you wish the church would arm you more to think like this? Okay? Rather than you coming to church and singing a bunch of, of stuff that makes you feel good but doesn't make you think, okay, and listening to sermonettes, and I'm not saying that happens here or at my church or, you know, but it happens in evangelicalism, okay? And, list, and, and reading little fluffy devotionals and so on, Jesus Calling, that's heresy. There's heresy in that book, okay? Re reading that stuff. Many of God's people, they don't know. Why? Because they're not taught to think biblically. And their kids, they send their kids to youth group. And I'm not saying that happens here. John, in fact, did a great job of, of trying to inculcate biblical truth. But sometimes we mix, we mix truth with a message that detracts from it or a way of, a way of doing things that detracts from it. It makes it look as though it doesn't fit in with the rest of the world. And so we've got to be careful. The world has got to take, oh, sorry, the church has got to take this book seriously. And they've got to comport their lives around this book.